There we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy and our class on Maori's Lamort d'Arthur. So we are coming into session four here tonight, and I think that we will end this session only one class behind. So that's pretty good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, <clears throat> of course, one of our regular attendees here is named Arthur Harrow, and he said, neat title slide, you must have seen my transcript. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, <laughs> Stephen is offering, he's noticing I'm not, I don't have a horse, and he's offering to uh, smite someone and give me their horse. Uh, that's, that's courteous of you, Stephen. Uh, uh, that's, just the, that's just the thing to do. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, thanks again, everybody, for joining me. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna power through a bunch of things tonight, <clears throat> but we're gonna be fine. We're totally gonna make it. Um, so, in the interest of, uh, um, in the interest of doing that, I'm gonna move on quickly to my announcements because I have a, uh, a a few announcements here this evening. Um, I got so many windows here. I don't even know what to do with myself. Okay, there we go. All right, that's so much better. Arranging my my uh, my screen real estate over here. Okay. Excellent. Um <laughs> Tarloniel says that the uh, the this uh, title encompasses the t entire Arthurian mythos. Yeah, it really does. It really does. Um uh, Cool. Okay, so um and uh, yes, Jeffrey, I can see I can see your questions there. I, I, of course, I should say, for those of you who are less familiar with our interface here, um, it, here within GoToWebinar, for those of you who are in the session here, um, I, usually I'm not, I, I I can never respond to everybody's comments because I, I get lots and lots of them as we go along. So uh, I apologize if I don't get to everybody's comments. And of course, uh, for the you know um, we we have two interfaces now too, and I'm looking at the Twitch chat as well. So. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Tim, send me an email and I'll tell you, I forget the name of this font offhand. Tim wants to know the font. I can't remember, but I'll tell you if you send me an email. Um, okay. Anyways, quick announcements. Announcement number one tomorrow, uh, is the next Mythgard movie club. And they're going to be discussing, uh, uh, they're going to be discussing Edward Scissorhands, which is a sort of modern classic, uh, in the, uh, science fiction genre, a uh, really interesting movie. Um, and of course, where can you find information on this? Where else, of course, on the Signum uh, webpage. So down here in our upcoming event section, you will see the link to the Edward Scissorhands uh, session. So you can see there's the, 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 the direct link to come into the webinar uh, here. When you click through onto this, uh, you can see the, uh, the details here. It starts at 8.30 p.m tomorrow august 2nd uh so you can read more about this here's the link that you need to be able to join very simple video will be posted later on as well uh so uh please do come for our uh for our film discussion um and uh i also i wanted to announce on friday this uh day after tomorrow um we're having our final session of season three of the silmarillion film project we are coming to the very end of our discussion of our third season uh in our planning we've been doing this for a long time now it's been over it's, been, it's now been three years that we have been planning uh our theoretical film adaptation of the silmarillion um, this whole thing that Amazon is is doing, they're basically just kind of riding on our coattails here. We've been already doing this for years, uh, except we get to actually do the Silmarillion because we don't need the rights because it's theoretical. Right. So it's all good. Um, anyway. Uh, so we're going to. Uh, uh, but anyway, th that that's uh, finishing up uh, this week and then we're going to be moving on to season four. So chronologically, we've gotten to the rising of the sun uh, and uh, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, doing the final of our post-production episodes uh, this week. And then we're going to be looking forward to I probably uh, we're going to take a little bit of time off and then probably in September we're going to come back and start season four and think about uh uh, the next section. So I'm going to be really, uh, going to be really excited for that. Um, oh no, wait, Arthur, we did just cast Luthien. I'm, I'm blanking. Whom do we cast as Luthien? Um, we cast, oh, the, uh, the, 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 I forget her name. The woman who played Lady Sybil in Downton Abbey. That's who we, 
whom we cast as Luthien. Um, Luthien is one of those classic roles, right? Where you just can't like, there's no, you, there's no way you can really cast Luthien. You, you, can, you know, it's like, okay, so what we're looking for here is the most beautiful woman who ever lived, right? If we can just get that. Um, but uh, she has the right size, the right coloring. And she also is, uh, uh, is a, uh, she's a dancer as well. She's a ballet dancer. So all things together, we thought that that were, would work out really well. So she, she's the one whom we cast as Luthien. I was very excited. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, so uh, so that anyway, film film has been great, great fun. Uh, and I just wanted to, to sort of mention it. It's a big moment uh, as we're finishing season three this week. Um, also, I want to um, I, I want to mention as well uh, Baymoot, this next thing that's coming up here. Baymoot is our next uh, regional event happening in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in Oakland, technically. Um, at Mills College, so uh, this is going to be this is going to be great fun. Uh, the registration deadline goes through next Saturday, through Saturday, August 11th. But I am going to be away most of that last week, so I won't be here to remind you. So this is the last time I will be reminding you uh, about uh, Baymoot registration. So please do uh, go ahead and uh, uh, and register for that if you're anywhere near in uh, Northern California. There, um, uh, so really good. Uh, Really good crowd showing up to Baymoot so far. Looking forward to, to seeing folks there. Um, two last things of a sort of a, a slightly more personal nature. Well, one, of course, is the first one is about really Signum as a whole, not just me personally. But uh, tomorrow, uh, it's not exactly an announcement in the sense that it's an event I'm inviting you all to. Uh, but uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., I will be going to a meeting of the Higher Education Commission in the state of New Hampshire where they will be voting uh, on uh, Signum University's approval in the state of New Hampshire. It's a big moment. Um, so um, I definitely uh, um, uh, I, I will be interested in sharing with you all how that goes. I feel really good about it. We had a really good meeting at our site visit. We felt the meeting, the you know, site visit went really well. Uh, have gotten some really great feedback and stuff. So uh, we're, uh, but it's a big day. Tomorrow's the tomorrow's the official day. Tomorrow's the uh, tomorrow's the uh, the official vote. So uh, two p.m. You know, you'd be thinking about us there at uh, two p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Um, and also, I um, I do. <laughs> Kurita is saying we should I should uh, 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 tweet my pics of the drink I toast to Signum with. Yeah, well, you know, Karita, I have to say the meeting is technically open to the public. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, when I was talking to the higher education director about it originally, he said, uh, you know, so if you wanted to, ha if you know, if people wanted to come, you know, if some of your people wanted to come, they they'd be welcome to. And I'm like, well, you know my people are going to want me to live stream it is what's going to happen. And he kind of got this look on his face like, uh, I'm not sure everybody would be okay with that. Um, but um, uh, anyway, anyway, <laughs> it's, it's all good. Um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll let you guys know how it went, but, um, but anyway, I wanted to mention that, especially since, as I say, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be here uh, next week. So, you know, I won't be doing the kind of immediate follow up next week. Um, but um, uh, but it's all going to be uh, it's all going to be good. Um, I know, Karita, right? If it's open to the public, why, why not live stream it? Right. I mean, that says open to the public to me, too. But anyway. It's all good. So that's happening at two o'clock. Uh, so uh, uh, so I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that. And the second thing is I wanted to remind you all, as I have already said, that I'm going to be away next week and going on vacation with my family next week. So I will not be around. Um, I will be less accessible than usual. And I will be uh, I, I won't be having any of my regular classes. So uh, we will ha you will have two weeks to read and contemplate the wonderful oddities of the story of Sir Balin uh, as we're doing there. So no Druid's Fire, I will be, it's, no, it's Friday, no, th Thursday is the meeting. Friday, I'll be here on Friday, Druid's Fire. So Friday stuff will be happening as normal. Uh, so that'll be fine. Um, yeah, anyway. <clears throat> um, cool, yeah. Oh, yes, and uh, Sharon is reminding me the Our Wrinkle in Time summer camp starts on Monday. Yes, on Monday the 6th, that's true. So, yeah. Cool. Um, lots of stuff going on this week. Um, and don't forget not to show up next week because we won't be here. Um, all right. Let us return to the text <clears throat> and power through the rest of the 
uh, book of Mer of, uh, of uh, you know this this first section of the book of Merlin here at the beginning. Um, all right, so tonight we will see Arthur not in his best light, right? These are some of the most questionable moments in the entire uh, history of Arthur. Um, and one thing, of course, that you can just sort of file away right away is that this is not a story that is setting out to try to put Arthur in a good light necessarily, right? Um, this is not just a glorified version of Arthur's story. This is not kind of adopting King Arthur as like the sort of, you know, historical political champion of England and, you know, wanting to show that, you know, he has established England as like the acme of awesomeness. Like that's not that's not how this story is going. And it's clear that that's not how this story is going. Right. Arthur is obviously very important. And, and from before his birth, Merlin is predicting um you know, how important and how, uh, uh, how influential he is going to be. But, um, it, um, this is not a story which is just trying to rose tint, uh, Arthur and his performance, right? Just, just not at all, uh, how it works. So we'll see a lot of that. Um, the, the biggest running thread through tonight's class is King Arthur screwing up and usually getting in trouble for it. Um, and sometimes attempting to cover up and doing, as usual, a disastrously, disastrously horrible job uh, doing that. Um, so anyway, so let's uh, let's get to it. Let's 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 join the battle sequence. We didn't quite get to the battle sequences last time, and I, I want to start off talking about that. Oh, a, a brief um, uh, saying hello to uh, 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 Hawthorne there, uh, who's joining us live for the first time. Glad you could, uh, glad you could be here. Um, Okay, let's keep going. The main thing I want to emphasize here as we, as, as, as we read this, this is a snapshot from one of the battles, right? Uh, the battle goes on for a long time, and I know it can be really hard to follow who is unhorsing whom and delivering the horse to whom uh, and all of that. This is, this is when we're playing musical horses, Katriana, exactly. Um, and... The thing that I want to the, the, the main thing I want to focus on here as we're looking at this is, again, as I've been asking, what is the text interested in here? Right. As we're reading this, what are we supposed to be getting from this? What can we tell about what's important in this story based upon what we're reading here? So here's one of my favorite moments from the battle. And meanwhile, come in King Arthur with an eager countenance and found Ulfans and Brastius on foot in great peril of death that were full defoiled under the horse fate. Then Arthur as a lion ran unto King Cradlement of North Wallace and smote him through the lift side that horse and man fell down. Then he took the horse by the rein and led him unto Ulfine and said, have this horse, mean old friend, for great need hast thou of an horse. Gramercy, said Alphonse. Then King Arthur did so marvellously in armies that all men had wonder. When the king with the hundred knictes saw King Cradlement on foot, he ran unto Sir Ector, Sir Kay's father, that was welly horsed, and smote horse and man down, and gaff the horse unto the king, and horsed him again. And when King Arthur saw that saw that king ride on Sir Ector's horse, he was wroth, and with his sword he smote the king on the helm, that a quarter of the helm and shield clave doon, and so the sword carved doon unto the horse neck, and so man and horse fell doon to the ground. Then Sir Kai come unto King Morganur, Seneschal with him of the King of the Hundred Knictes, and smote him down horse and man, and led the horse unto his father, Sir Ector. Okay, so obviously the whole musical horses thing, right, um, uh, is, um, <laughs> so um, what do we learn from this? This is like the primary reality of battle, right? I mean, that's one thing that is very clear. Uh, if there's one thing that is super important in battle, it is having a horse. Remember how Merlin had like 10,000 horse and 5,000 foot and just left the foot soldiers behind? Like, who cares, right? Those are expendable. Not expendable in the sense that we don't care if we get them killed. Expendable in the sense we don't even need to bring them to the battle, right? We've got the 10,000 horse. We're fine, right? So... 
uh, Maori is writing from a perspective of like uh, un varnished, like unalloyed prejudice in favor of the cavalry, right? It is kind of obvious where he comes from. What he can, to, to Mallory, battle is mounted knights fighting against each other. That's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Um, notice what is utterly missing from his account of battle. Entirely uh, missing is anything like battlefield tactics, right? I mean, there are ways, for instance, that good commanders can counter cavalry, right? Cavalry is not, I mean, they're a very powerful weapon on a medieval battlefield, but they're not like completely undefeatable, right? There's, there are other ways to fight. Um, nobody ever does this, right? We never, we almost never uh, get, uh, get anything about them, right? Um, so... Anyhow, this is, uh, th this is, th he's, are, are there archers? Like, does anybody shoot a bow? <laughs> you will almost never see a bow shot anywhere. This is England, mind, right? This is England within, like, 50 years of the Battle of Agincourt, and we're, we're, there are no bows. Nobody shoots bows anywhere, right? Um, Mallory is totally unashamed about, um, uh, about, his sort of preferred mode of combat. And that's what he, that's what he describes. Honestly, like, as you can see here, he doesn't even try to give any real sense as he's describing the battle of the ebb and flow of the combat, right? Like he, he not only does he not care about the battlefield tactics that would come up, but he also, um, he also doesn't care about, uh, the, the, like which side is winning at a particular time. Occasionally we'll get references to things like that, but almost entirely what comes up, right? What the, what a battle description is, is in Maori is one solo encounter after another, right? Um, it's this series of, especially often this sort of chain of events, right? This person on horses, this person, and then another person sees that happen. One of his friends sees that happen. And unhorses him, right? And brings his horse back over to the other guy who is unhorsed. And then somebody else sees that. And then they unhorse that other guy, right? I mean, this kind of chain of, chain of events is often happening. What you can see is a kind of, um, is a kind of uh, 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 individual scorekeeping, right? Um, so again, if you're trying to keep, if, if, if you're, if you're trying to, to, to keep track of, um, um, uh, you know, again, like the overall picture of the battle or thinking about this from a, like a general ship perspective, these battles are going to be totally unsatisfying to you. Right. But that's not how you should be looking at it, how you should be reading these battles. It's again, based on what it, on what he emphasizes, right? What he emphasizes are the individual feats of arms of individual people. Right. And those cumulatively add up to victory of one side or another. Right. Arthur wins this not because he is the greatest general, not because he has the superiority, as he doesn't, right? He has way fewer people than the Eleven Kings, um, but because his individual knights beat the other individual knights. So, you know, the sense that you get in reading this is that you should have a kind of scorecard, right? You should be keeping score, like at a baseball game. Who has unhorsed whom, right? Right. And, uh, and so it's not just a question of quantity, right? The total number of other people who are unhorsed, uh, by, so, so like when you're measuring King Lot, for instance, you're trying to fill out the, you know, the, 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 the scoring line for King Lot in this battle. It's not just a question of how many total people he's unhorsed. It's whom he unhorses, right? So when he comes along and unhorses somebody who has already been described as unhorsing several other important people, Right then that one on horsing by, by King Lot then trumps the, the others, right? So you've got, um, uh, that honestly seems to be, again, this kind of, this kind of individual scorecard sort of approach really seems to be, um, the way that you, uh, um, the way that you need to think about, uh, this, that seems to be the, what Maori himself is primarily, um, is primarily interested in. Um, so, uh, yeah, Nancy says, I guess we know what Mallory's role on the battlefield probably was. 
Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And he's he's totally he's totally um absolutely unashamed <laughs> about that. Um uh so yeah, Nancy says, I guess I have to remember who's on whose team too then. Sort of. Sort of. I mean, yes, yes, like if you wanna if you're interested in who's winning between King Arthur and his followers and, you know, these eleven kings, you do need to remember the the main players, right, in order to be able to tell who's doing who's doing better. But honestly, uh, you know, Nancy that matters less actually than the individual accomplishments, right? When you're told that somebody like King Lot, right, does exceptionally well and has unhorsed many knights and and has, uh, uh, you know, has has defeated X, Y, and Z, right? That honestly matters more than the fact that he, in a sense, that matters more than the fact that he happens to be lined up on the other side against King Arthur, right? That, of course, in a sense, is more important for the bigger picture, but there's also a sense in which it's less important than his personal prowess and his personal honor. Um, so, uh, well, no, see, David, it's not quite that simple. Uh, it would be, I mean, that's complicated enough, right, David Erbach is imagining a, a system of, like, where you get, like, 50 points for unseating a king and, and, and 30 points for unseating a duke. Sort of, but see, no, it's not like that. It's more... Um, Honestly, what it's kind of like is like the 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 ranking system in modern tennis, right? Like, you know, how do you move up from being the number five tennis player in the world to the number three tennis player in the world, right? It matters not only how how many matches you've won, but whom you've beaten, right? If you win a bunch of matches against low level competition, your your ranking isn't going to go up very much, right? But you know, if, you know, you're there and it's Wimbledon and you, you know, beat the number one ranked person in the world, you're moving up, right? That's how these battles work um, once these people are established. So when King Ban comes out, right, when King Ban emerges, remember, there's there's like wailing when he comes out because he has a massive reputation, right? King Ban is called the best knight in the world. Um, but he, and I'm pretty sure it's King Lot, right? King Lot fetches him a buffet on the head, which stuns him for a while, right? He's not defeated, King Van isn't, right? He's not unhorsed, um, but he gets staggered uh, and, uh, and is, is, is briefly bested, or at least matched by King Lot. That's more points for King Lot than almost anything else that he's done over the course of the day. Um, so... Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, no, no, Lee. It's not very much like like Renfield's equations about how many flies you have to eat in order to get to equal the life of force of one spider. It's a little bit like that, but not quite like that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Um, Yeah, let's see. Matthew says, so it's kind of like you get 20 points for unhorsing someone plus one point for everyone he has previously unhorsed. Well, yes, unless he previously unhorsed somebody really important, right? In which case you get more than one point for that. Again, I, I, I can't say that I can, I can't pretend that I could come up with a mathematical formula that would do it justice. All I'm saying is this kind of thinking seems to be very much how Mallory is thinking here and what he's really interested in. This is why we're getting this blow by blow, right? Um, we're, this is why we're getting this, what seems just like a, this kind of cascading list of, and then this person on horse, this person, and this person on horse, this person. And you may have, um, have found yourself in the midst of that thinking, why do I care? Do I have to memorize these lists, right? Is there a reason I care about who exactly unhorsed whom? And, um, um, and anyway, and the answer is, well, kind of, yes. I mean, it's not to say that every single person on these lists is super important. Many of them, some of them we will meet many times. King Lot's important. The King with a hundred knights is important. Um, but you know, King Cradlement is not going to have a huge run, uh, in, in the book, but, but you know, many of these people are important. It's to see what Kay is doing and what Sir Grifflet is doing. And, um, you know, many of these guys are, 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 are important in fact, and we, we will, uh, uh, we'll see more of them. And in fact, in some of them, we'll see less on the battlefield. K in particular, 
um, I would say is is really interesting to watch. Notice here at the end, it's Sir Kay um, who comes unto King Morganur, who is the seneschal with the King of the Hundred Knights, and smites him down in order to lead the horse unto his father, Sir Ector, right? So the fact that Kay is able to avenge the unhorsing of his own father, Sir Ector, and supply his dad uh, with a new horse, Arthur and Kay kind of team up, right? Uh, Arthur punishes the guy who rides off on Ector's horse uh, and, in fact, does kill him. Yes, someone was asking a question about this before. Um, that, that dude's dead, right? Yes, that dude is dead. Um, a quarter of his helm and his shield are cloven away, and that would have taken a great deal of his head with it. So, yes, absolutely. And you may remember the passage later on in the description of this battle when King Arthur is described standing there fighting with his sword and shield uh, completely covered with blood and brains, right? So um, they're, not, um, they're not playing for counters, here in this battle, this is a serious. This is a serious battle. Um, but Jeffrey, it is very like a giant tournament. The difference is they are playing for keeps, and people are going to be killed. People can be grievously wo uh, wounded or even uh, or even uh, killed in tournaments, but that's not what you're going for, right? Um, here, they're not. Um, uh, this is uh, this is definitely more 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 serious business. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Tomas, I agree. Tomas says uh, the whole no battle tactics description thing isn't new. The Iliad itself is little more than a list of individual fights for the most part. Yeah, no, exactly. It's it's very similar in that way. And again, there, the Iliad is another good example, right? What is the Iliad interested in, in its battle sequences? It's not really very interested in the question of who is the better general, right, between Agamemnon and Hector? Nor is it really interested in the question even of Greeks versus Trojans as much as it is, as it is interested in the actions of individual heroes. And, of course, Homer differs from Maori in that he's even more interested in the deaths of individual. Like, it's the, the people who are being killed who tend to get a lot of uh, description focused on them. Uh, in uh, in Homer, where we don't see that so much uh, here in Maori, but um, uh, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and t Tony says, "Is this why Tolkien takes away a lot of the tactics to emulate this style of writing?" In, perhaps, in a sense, Tony. Though I, I think I might perhaps say, because he enjoyed this kind of writing, that's kind of how he thought about battles too. But now, notice when Tolkien describes a battle. He does not describe in great detail the military tactics like, you know, we don't get in Tolkien a lot of like advance your bowmen on the left so that they can like and, you know, bring up the pikemen over here so as to counter the like we don't get any of that kind of stuff. Almost never get that kind of stuff uh, in, uh, in 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 Tolkien's battles. But what Tolkien does give us is the sort of bigger picture. Right, like the Rohirrim advancing and the Haradrim falling back, right, and the Haradrim going into into retreat, and the, you know it's that kind of thing, right? We do get the sort of big picture of Tolkien's very interested in which side is winning at a particular time, whereas this is just like a scrum, right? It's just like a melee, and what matters are the individual people, and in a sense that matters more than, and I, and I really want to emphasize this. That matters more even than what side they're on. The fact that King Lot is such a good knight is actually, I think, more important as a take-home from this battle than the fact that he's fighting against King Arthur, right? Fighting against King Arthur, that's a thing that can change, right? And it will change eventually, sort of. Um, uh, what, um, what is, like, so... <laughs> Where the alliances lie and who is on whose side, that's fungible, right? Is he a great knight? Is he a knight of prowess and a knight of honor? That's indelible, right? And if you establish that, if, if that's true, it doesn't really matter that much which side he's on exactly. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, David, I did interview somebody several years ago about Tolkien's military tactics. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so this was all, this was all fun stuff. Um, 
And by the way, just the the <laughs> my favorite moments. Anytime anybody stops in a battle to say gramercy to anybody is always my favorite moment. You know, this this uh, you know, King Amir may stop in the middle of battle to chant verses, right? Arthur and Ulfius stop in the middle of battle to have this exchange. Have this horse, mine old friend, for great need hast thou of an horse. Gramercy, said Ulfius. It's But again, notice, like, why do we get that? Like, what, why has he interrupted the dramatic flow? Uh, he's in the middle of describing blow by blow, right, the battle. And he's like, we now pause to give you a brief rundown of the small talk between two of the people on the battle. Like, do we need to know that he says Gramercy? Answer, yes. And, and, and that means thank you. It's just, it's, it's the, a very simple term. It just means thank you. Um, uh, but um, anyway, so Nancy, exactly. We need to know that, that Olfens or Olfius or Olfin or whatever he wants to call himself has good manners. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to see the courteousness of the exchange between them, right? Obviously, that matters. He, he, he puts it, so it, it matters, right? He wouldn't have put it if it didn't matter. Um, so the, and, and he does it more than once. The fact that we need to interrupt the flow of the battle in order to, uh, to convey these apparently crucial things. Um, um, this is, uh, the, it's, it's important, right? Um, to see the way, it helps to show us why all of these things are happening. Um, because notice something. Although there is this kind of sense of scorekeeping, right? Um, and everybody has their own individual tally card, right? Um, you, you're not just out for points. You're not just playing for points. And I don't mean that in the sense of playing for points versus playing for keeps. What I mean is... That's not what motivates them. Now, sometimes they will go and fight up against somebody else because it's a challenge, right, that they want to face or to measure themselves against. But what we see is what motivates each one of these encounters is personal, right? Arthur sees his two of his uh, oldest friends and, and most dedicated supporters, Ulfius and Brastius, on foot, uh, which is to say in great peril, right? So in order to help them and rescue them, he goes and he, he unhorses King Cradlement of North Wales. Now, King Cradlement of North Wales is one of the 11 kings. This is one of the, the primary opponents of King Arthur. You'd think that Arthur's primary motivation to go after King Cradlement would be to teach King Cradlement a lesson, right? That'll teach you not to recognize my overlordship, jerk, right? But that's not Arthur's thought, right? Arthur only... Arthur goes to... To King Cradlement and knocks him off his horse because his friend Ulfius needs a horse, right? That's what motivates him. Um, and the king with a hundred knights sings, sees King Cradlement on foot and he unhorses Sir Ector. But that really ticks off both Arthur and Kay because they're seeing their foster father and father respectively uh, now on foot. And so Arthur just goes crazy, right? He is wroth. Uh, and uh, 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 decapitates the guy, or cleaves the head of the guy and almost decapitates the horse, uh, therefore not really being able to restore it to Sir Ector, and it's left to Kay uh, to get him another horse. But again, th this is the motivation, right? It's all about your loyalty to your friends. That's the important thing here, right? It's not even about the politics of the situation. It's not even about winning, in, in a sense, Right. Again, as far as one side versus the other are concerned. Um, Tarloniel says, but Hector does not say Gramercy. Yeah, we don't get that every time. Right. Uh, it's only, and, and it's it's one of the things, Tarloniel, that I've always been interested to do. Like, is there is there a trend like. Is there something that connects those moments? Because it's not just this one. I, I chose this one, but there are others. Right. Uh, we'll get like 15 different unhorsings and rehorsings. And in the middle of it, we'll get one dude where we get the Gramercy exchange between them. Right. 
Why? Why do we get it for that one? And I would presu- presumably Gramercy was said other times as well. Why has he told us that Gramercy was said that one time and not another time? Here, it seems relatively clear, right? Because he's wanting to show us Arthur's, um, you know, Ar- Arthur helping out his friends is not a side effect of his taking down King Cradlement of North Wales, right? It is the whole motivation for him taking down uh, King Cradlement of North Wales, as he immediately makes clear through his words to Ulfius. Um so that's good, and that it 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 you know that's progress. We've learned something there. That's character development for Arthur and us understanding who he is and 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 more about the kind of king that he is. But we also get it in other places where it's less obvious to me why that one stands out. But anyway, it's certainly something that I'd be interested in looking at more uh, more carefully. Um, uh, anyhow, okay. Let's keep going because there's a, 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 another battlefield scene. This is when um, um, this is King Lot commenting on the coming into battle of King Ban and King Bors. Aha, said King Lot, we must be discomfit, for yonder I see the most valiant knicht of the world and the man of most renown, for two such brethren as is King Ban and King Bors are not living. Wherefore, we must need is void or die. But if we avoid manly and wisely, there is but death. Quick syntax point. And but if we avoid. But if means, and unless we do this, then there is but death. Right. So, but if we avoid manly and wisely, there is but death. Unless we avoid. Um, which means, to, let's, uh, let's void. Right. By the way, I... I would, I would kind of like to, uh, I, I would kind of like to, 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 to bring that back. Right. That's, that's gotta be a saying that we could bring back. Right. You know, instead of saying like, Hey, let's, you know, let's split, let's, uh, let's beat. You'd be like, Hey, let's void. Right. Um, I like it. <laughs> let's avoid. Uh, so, um, yeah, they must courageously run away wisely and manly Jeffrey run away. Right. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, keep going. So when these tall kingis, Ban and Bors, come into the battle, they come in so fiercely that the strokes redoomed it again through the wood and the water. Wherefore King Lot wept for pity and dole that he saw so many god knictes tack their end. But through the great force of King Ban, they made both the northern battles that were parted hurtled, hurtled together for great dread. And the three kingas and their knictes slew on ever that it was pity to see and to behold the multitude of people that fled. But King Lot and the king with a hundred knictes and King Morganur gathered the people together passing knictly and did great prowess of arms and held the battle all the day like hard. All right. So what do we learn here? Um, uh... <laughs> Yes, I see lots of people are wanting to quote Sir Robin's minstrels here. Um, king Lot, right? He's a wise and manly king, right? And has certainly shown his prowess throughout the day. Um, several things that we can notice here. First of all, he, the reputation of King Ban and King Bors, right? As soon as he sees King Ban break out of his bushment, right? Out of his ambush. Uh, and and join the field. Uh, King Arthur tells them to delay, right? Don't come into the battle right away. Let us start. And then after a while, King Boris comes in, and then King Ban comes in. It's kind of like the dwarves at Bjorn's house, right? Um, <laughs> they're going to come in after a while when he whistles, and uh, and they're going to join the battle. And when King Boris joins in, Lot is like, oh, man, you know. Uh, and then uh, uh, then King Ban comes, and he he despairs, Right? This is when he says that thing that I quoted <laughs> that I quoted on Twitter because it's one of my favorite lines in all of Mallory. Uh, Jesus defend us from death and horrible maims. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's um, it's 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 he the respect that he has, and again he uh, he knows the rankings right. This is the number one ranked guy in the world who's coming onto the field right now, right? Um, and they've already been fighting all the day. Uh, he knows they've got to void or die, 
right? If they if they stay here, they're going to be killed. Uh, King Ban and King Bors are, are going to are going to kill them. Um, look at the um, but but notice what happens with King Lot and the King with a hundred knights and King Morganor, right? Look at the praise that is heaped on them by Maori here, right? Maori is. Not only is he not, as I was suggesting at the very beginning, <clears throat> not only is he not out just to glorify Arthur, right, and make him out to be the greatest knight and king ever in all ways, he's also not out to demonize his enemies either, right? He gives respect. He gives props to King Lot and the King with the Hundred Knights and King Morganor here, right? They do passing knightly. That's a big compliment from Maori, right? Um, they gather the people to get her passing knightly and did great prowess of arms and held the battle all the day like hard, right? All day like hard. They didn't slack off at any point, nor did they weaken and falter as the day continued, right? And it's not just that their own prowess of arms persisted, right? And that they showed what great... Uh, 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 and powerful knights they were, but also the, the way that they gathered their people together was passing nightly. The, their, their, their leadership was really, um, uh, was, was, was really good. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and look at King Lot's, one of the striking things is King Lot's weeping here. Right. What is he weeping for? Weeping for pity and dole that he saw so many good knictis talk their end. Right. He's seeing his knights dying all over the place. Right. And he's weeping for pity and for dole, for sorrow, for sadness. Right. Over the death of all of these people. Um, it's interesting because there are very few places where modern sensibilities and medieval sensibilities are so far apart as in perceptions of violence. They had a very strong stomach for violence, uh, much more than we do. Um, and <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? When a knight is described as going in and slaying on the left hand and the right hand uh, so that it was wonder to see, that is unironic compliment from Mallory, right? I mean, it's, um, it's a good thing. Right. Um, it's a good thing when you, you know, are, are like Arthur standing there covered in the brains and blood of his opponents. That's awesome right there. That is we're we're supposed to admire him for that. If we're looking at this and thinking, oh, the senseless violence, we're not reading it right. I mean, we're, we're rather we're just we're applying a modern sensibility, which I think is totally alien um, to the text. Uh but notice in this pass fr from this passage we can see it's not that they don't care right um it's not that losses in battle are totally immaterial and there is a it, you know the 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 cost of war is definitely felt right um and the loyalty that's not quite the right word but I'll stick with it. The loyalty that a knight shows, especially a king, for the knights under his command, um, and his weeping for them openly, shamelessly weeping uh, for uh, the his knights who have been killed in 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 the battle in front of him. Um, this is this is uh, again. This is a good. This this is this is Lot coming off well, right? This entire passage. I th is praiseworthy of, of Lot. King Lot comes off well in this whole passage, I think, from beginning to end, right? His acknowledgement and recognition of King Ban. He is showing wisdom and prudence as well as respect, right? And knight knightly respect. Knights who are insulting of others, right? Who speak ill of those who are praiseworthy. Those are bad knights, right? But somebody who sees a worshipful knight like King Ban enter the field and gives him the honor and respect that he's due, that's a good thing, right? It shows that Lot is fundamentally a good egg. His weeping for pity and dole over his own knights that are being killed also shows him to be a good egg. And his gathering his people together, right, to rally them, to prevent them from, from being routed, uh, and as well as his, of course, uh, great prowess of arms, 
and uh, holding the battle all the day like hard. We've got the complete package here in King Lot, right? Wisdom and uh, uh, and and compassion and um, uh, and 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 prowess as well, right? King Lot's King Lot's great. Um, and this is important, right? Because you remember who he is, right? Who's King Lot? What's important about King Lot? Why do we care about King Lot? Do you remember? It's a quiz. Yes, he's Gawain's father, uh, Matt. Exactly. He's 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 Gawain's uh, 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 father. Uh, Arthur sleeps with his wife, Joe. Yes, also true. And no, it's not Morgan. It's Morgaz that he's married to. It's uh, uh, Queen Morgaz who is the mother of Sir Gawain and also the um, uh, the mother of Mordred as well. But yeah, so King Lot is the father of Gawain. And, uh, um, and, and uh, it, it's, well, he's Arthur's uncle by marriage. Yeah, I mean, they are connected by marriage. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Um, anyhow, yeah. So, uh, so King, Lot is, King Lot is important because Sir Gawain... Sir Gawain is, is, is important. And although, you know, King Lot is here on the opposite side, right? He's, he's one of the leaders, if not the leader of the 11 kings who are here gathered to oppose Arthur's kingship here at the very beginning. Gawain, of course, his son, is going to become the greatest upholder of Arthur and of his reign um, uh, pretty much through, uh, through the whole rest of the, uh, through the whole rest of the work. Though Gawain is an interesting character, and we'll have plenty of time to talk about Gawain as we move forward. Um, okay. At the end of the battle, you may remember, um, Arthur is wanting to keep attacking, right? The the knights are withdrawing. The king, the eleven kings are withdrawing. Um, they've all survived individually, right? Many of the, like, more than half of their men have been killed, but they've individually survived, uh, and they're trying to retreat. And Arthur wants to pursue them, right? Arthur wants to chase them down. Um, uh, with that, come Merlion on a great black horse and side unto King Arthur. Thou hast never done. Hast thou not done now? Of three score thousand this day hast thou left on live but fifteen thousand. Therefore it is time to say, Ho! For God is wroth with thee, for thou will never have done. For yonder, uh, for yonder eleven kings at this time will not be overthrown, but an thou tarry, uh, but an thou tarry on them any longer. Thy fortune will turn, and they shall increase, and therefore withdraw you unto your lodging, and rest you as soon as ye may, and reward your good knictes with gold and with silver, for they have well deserved it. There may no riches be too dare for them, for of so few men as ye have there was never men dood more worshipfully in prowess than ye have done today, for ye have matched this day with the best fichters of the world. That is truth, said King Ban and Bors. Than Merlion bade him, withdraw where ye list, for this three year I dare undertake, they shall not dare you, and by that time ye shall hear new tidings. Then Merlion said unto Arthur, These eleven kinges have more on hand than they are aware of, for the Saracens are landed in their countries more than forty thousand, and bren and slay, and have laid siege to the castle Wandesboro and mark great destruction. Therefore, dread you not this, dread you not this three year. Okay. Um, yes, it now means enough. By the way, I want to introduce uh, a, a, uh, a convention, if we can do that, okay? Um, and we can do it both on Twitch, actually, and in, in, in the Netmoot session. So if you have a, a, word, a vocabulary or grammar question, Right. Uh, just a simple like, I don't understand this phrase. What the heck does this mean? I want to make sure that I don't miss those questions because those are important. And I want to make sure and, and, and everyone's going to have those questions, too. So but I, I want to be able to see it as I get a lot of comments and I don't get a chance necessarily to 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 look through all of them with the same care. So I want to make sure that we that those jump out. Right. So start with a word. Put in all caps. Uh, what should we put in all caps? 
language, lang, something like that, right, in all caps at the beginning, so that I know that you just have a language question. Yeah, say, say lang, right? Lang in all caps. Um, <laughs> word vocab. Everybody's everybody's suggesting words. Yeah. Uh, let's just say lang. Let's say, let's say lang. Uh, really, anything will get my attention. <laughs> but those, I got this wall of all caps words over here. Um, yeah, any of those things will do. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. So just do that, and then we can see. But so yeah, yeah. Enow, I-N-O-W, does mean enough. Um, another phrase, let's see. Um, yes, uh, again, notice the but and con uh, construction again. For yonder eleven kings at this time will not be overthrown, but and thou tarry on them any longer. And in this case is not a conjunction, that's a preposition, right? But if, essentially is what that means. But if you tarry, on them any longer, if you keep attacking them any longer, thy fortune will turn and they shall increase. Right? So fortune will turn on you. Your, your, your fortune is good right now. Your fortune is going to turn and they will increase. If you continue, um, if you continue, then they're going to start winning. So knock it off. Um, yeah, Hawthorne, great question. Uh, can we go over... Merlin's use of thou and ye here. Yes, let's see. Um, thou hast never done, hast thou not done enough? Thou, of course, is the singular, so he's speaking to Arthur. Uh, uh, hast thou left on life but 15,000? Um, God is wroth with thee, for thou wilt never have done. Um, Yes, and therefore withdraw you unto your lodging. So notice he's shifted there. Um, but and thou tarry on them any longer, thy fortune will turn and they shall increase. So all the way through there, through those first few sentences, he's speaking to Arthur personally, right? Then he expands it. And therefore withdraw you, plural, unto your plural lodging and rest you as soon as ye may. Plural all the way through there, right? Because he's speaking to Arthur and Ban and Bors, right? Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and so you, you, so you can tell again, he's still talking, withdraw where ye list for this three year, I dare undertake, they shall not dare you. Um, those 11 kings are not going to attack again. Y'all are safe, right? Um, so you guys, all of you can withdraw. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, let's see. Um, so let's see, Oliver says, did Terry, did, did Terry mean to continue rather than to delay, or does it depend on context? Um, yeah, well, Terry, as you can see in this context here, right, um, uh, where were we here? Uh, but and thou tarry on them any longer. Um, it, it, so tarry in this context would seem to mean like if you keep doing what you're doing, if you if you if you, yeah, like keep going, right? So to tarry, as I, I like meaning to wait around, right? To delay. Well, that's again continuing to do what you've been doing, which is nothing yet. Like if you if if you've not started something and you're tarrying, it means you're still doing what you were doing, right? You haven't transitioned to doing a new thing. Uh, here he's supposed to transition to doing a new thing, which is not fighting them anymore. Um, yeah, so, ah, uh, who or what are the Saracens? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Saracens are Muslims. Um, and let us be perfectly clear about something. They are the bad guys almost always, right? Um, almost always. Uh, remember that, we're, you know, we're, we're still in the times of the Crusades, right? The Saracens are the bad guys. If you want to find a set of enemies who are generally demonized, right, and treated like, again, unlike King Lot, who's a, who's a good guy just on the wrong side here, right, or you know, politically opposed to Arthur, but he's a good guy, um, the Saracens, generally not. This is why... One of the most fascinating, for my money, one of the most fascinating nights of the entire 
story of all of Lamarck d'Arthur is Sir Palamides. Sir Palamides is a, is a Saracen. He's a Muslim knight. Um, and he is a fascinating, fascinating character. Possibly, possibly my favorite character uh, in the whole book. Certainly, I think, um, I've long thought, and I'm still waiting. Um, come on, Hollywood. Come on, Amazon. Come on, Netflix. Get in on this. I got to talk to Dave. Uh, tell him to tell Netflix to do this. Uh, Dave Kell works for Netflix now. Um, I got to tell Dave to tell Netflix to make a movie about Sir Palamides. Oh, man, that would be such an awesome movie. And you'll I think you'll see over the next couple months why I think that. Um, but um, anyway, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, yeah, so the Saracens are the Saracens are are invading Muslims. Why are they invading Wales? Uh, I don't know why they're invading Wales exactly. Uh, um, but uh, it's OK. Um, uh, we don't necessarily need to know what matters is these 11 kings have more on hand than they are aware of. Right. Yeah, they've uh, um they're going to be when they get home, they're going to be busy. Right. They don't realize how busy they're going to be, but they're going to be they're going to be busy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. OK. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Let's see. I'm looking back over other comments. I was looking at Lang comments, and I want to make sure I didn't miss the other ones here. Um, David Atlee is concerned that Merlin's rebuke here is a little hypocritical. Um, oh, well, we'll get to that particular piece of potential hypocrisy later on. Notice, though, the force of his rebuke. What is Arthur doing wrong? Right. What is Arthur doing wrong? Um, oh, Catriona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. We, we, um, best to not even use the phrase historical accuracy when thinking about this. And the reason I say that, it's not. I say that not because medievals had lower... This is one of the things I object to when modern people talk about this. It's not that people in the Middle Ages had a lower standard of historical accuracy. They had a completely different standard of historical accuracy. To talk about history and to be true to history simply meant something very different to them than it means to us. And I think that our histories would be as puzzling and strange to them uh, as... Uh, as, as um, as theirs seem to us. Um, anyway, um, so, so yeah, but, 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 but yeah, don't be, um, if you forget everything pretty much that you ever knew about European history, you'll be fine. It's, you won't miss it. <laughs> okay. You won't miss it. It'll be fine. Um, yeah. So Wes, I agree. What, uh, what Arthur does wrong is not knowing when a now is a now. Absolutely. Um, God is wroth with thee, for thou wilt n will never have done. Remember the emphasis that we were seeing in the battle, right? What matters here? What matters is not what side people are on. What matters are the people, right? And the respect that they're giving each other. Um, these, you know, they, they've won, they've done well. They have defeated the, the, these 11 Kings who are themselves the best fighters in the world. They were overmatched by a larger force led by the greatest fighters in the world and they've beaten them. Right. What is Arthur trying to, but Arthur's trying to win in a more significant way. Right. He's he's got them on the run now. He's going to what? Pursue them and, and, and wipe them out. Is he upset because his 11 opponents are all escaping him? None of them have been killed or captured in the battle. Right. So this is what personal for him, politically personal for him. That's not OK. Right now. OK, notice this, the framework of that. You know, if this were a George R. R. Martin novel, 
they would, you know, it, 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 Arthur would be completely correct, right? What matters is the political expediency of the situation. If you have this big battle, which seems to go really well, but all of your enemies escape to go on and fight another day and to continue scheming against you, you've lost, right? But that is exactly the opposite of the of of thinking when 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 king arthur is thinking like that like but those kings are still opposing me and they're escaping so i'm going to pursue them and hunt them down um exactly carrie he wants to do the deeds that consolidate his kingdom now it, that would seem like a a wise move on his part right but not only is it rejected as wisdom by merlin right um that is i mean rejected as being wisdom um God is wroth with him, right? He is committing sin in doing this, right? He wasn't committing sin in fighting in the battle. He wasn't committing sin in, in any, but he's committing sin in continuing to pursue them, right? Um, is it because he's taking vengeance? That's what he wants to punish them for opposing him. I don't know. It just the lack of mercy, like the, you know, my, my, my opponent is wanting to leave the field honorably and I don't, I, I want to not let him. And that's the sort of sinful thing that, uh, that, that, that Merlin is describing. Um, I don't know, but notice, um, Arthur's, um, Arthur's, um, uh, impulse to, towards mercilessness here, towards, he gets carried away, right? He gets caught up in the moment, right? We're beating them. They're getting away from us. I'm going after them, right? That's, Arthur has a tendency to that, right? He has a tendency to rash action, not the kind of rash action necessarily where he just like up and charges into something without thinking. He does that too sometimes. But when Arthur gets the bit in his teeth, right? He's hard to stop. Um, And this is, you know, we see this is the first rebuke that Arthur receives, uh, in that way. Um, you know, Tara asks, would that be considered bloodlust? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's not the phrase that is, that he, that it uses here. Um, thou will never have done is what, is how Merlin describes it. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. He's, um, he doesn't know, as Wes said, he doesn't know when a now is a now, right? Um, uh, he doesn't stop while he's ahead. He doesn't. So I mean, sometimes that's just foolish, but often it is. It it comes in this case. It seems, in Merlin's opinion, certainly to active wickedness, right? Um, let's look at. Um, so here's more Merlin actions. Um, Jeffrey asks, would it be considered unknightly to lose control of oneself? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I mean, like if, if you're in battle with somebody and they yield themselves and you kill them after they've yielded themselves, that is very bad. Right. And that's functionally what Arthur is doing here. Right. It is like he was fighting an individual duel and his opponent yielded himself uh, to Arthur and said, you win, I give in. And Arthur still swapped off his head while he was kneeling on the ground in front of him. Right. That's essentially scaled up what Arthur is trying to do here. And Merlin is, you know, smacking him on the nose for it. Um, and Matthew, I do think that there is some political reality here um, that he's risking alienating the people whom he's hoping to lead. It's true. These are not, these are not invading Saracens he's fighting against, right? These are guys who should be loyal to him. Um, and in the end, he should be not trying to destroy them. He should be trying to win them over. Ultimately fighting them was the right thing to do because they were opposing him. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So. Great question, Bruce, before we even start. Chorlis. Three Chorlis. Churls. Peasants. Um, uh, churl is not an insult. I mean, it kind of is an insult. If you if you call the knight a churl, you'd be insulting him. But it's it's a description, right? A peasant is a churl. If a knight is acting like a churl, that's bad. That's an insult, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, they can't help being churls. Um, 
Now, it does, of course, get the, um, you know, Carrie, as you suggest, it gets the kind of connotation of something like ruffian. But again, that's just in the same way that, you know, villain, which just meant peasant, somebody who lives in the country, uh, comes to mean somebody who is uh, wicked, right? Um, that's uh, a very common... Um, the the alignment of morality with class is a very, very common linguistic feature. Anyway. Um, and so Arthur rode a soft pass till it was die, and then he was war of three chorlas chassing Merlin, and would have slain him. Then the king rode unto them and bade him flee, churlis. Then they fared sore when they saw a knicht come and fled. Ah, Merlion, said Arthur, here hadst thou be slain for all thy crafties, had not I been. Nay, said Merlin, not so, for I could have saved myself, and I had walled. But thou art more near thy death than I am, for thou goest to thy death ward, and God be not thy friend. Carita, I agree. Thou ghost to thy death word, and God be not thy friend. It's a great phrase, right? Um, that's um, kind of awesome, actually. Um, so, oh yeah, Tony, exactly. Vulgar is another perfect example of that kind of word, which is just a descriptor, which takes on a, a, a strong weight. Um, anyway, okay. This is a data point in trying to understand the question, why the heck does Merlin do what he does, right? Why? Why? Um, and I, I wanted to look at this passage coming on the heels of the last one when he was rebuking Arthur, right? Um, because it's clear that Merlin sees that as part of his job, right? Part of Merlin's job description is to teach Arthur lessons. And notice here, he is enacting this, Um here he is being chased by three peasants who are trying to kill him, such that Arthur legitimately believes he has just saved Merlin's skin. Merlin would have died, right? Here hadst thou be slain for all thy craft is, had not I been. Um, nine. Not so, right? I could have saved myself any time I wanted to, right? And he's not just saying that. I have no reason to disbelieve Merlin here, right? So why did he do it? He arranged this somehow. So Merlin set up this whole scene so that Arthur would come and see him in danger and save him. Why? So that he could deliver this line. But thou art more near thy death than I am. Right? Um, and this is, uh, Tarlonio, I absolutely agree. This is very Old Testament prophet. Right. Very Old Testament prophet, like the Old Testament prophet who marries a prostitute in order to enact uh, the 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 state of the relationship between God and Israel at the time. Right. Um, yeah. This is very like I am I'm I am I am not only going to proclaim thing, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to play it out. Right. I'm going to dramatize it for you. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, But notice his focus here ultimately is pedagogical, right? I'm delivering a warning to you and I want you to understand. Hold on to that image, right? That image of me being chased by the peasants, right? Not only the danger that I was in, but the, the ignominy of that danger. He could have presumably orchestrated any number of near-death experiences for himself, right? Why did he choose this one? Um... Because think about the two things, right? First, what kind of danger was he in? Again, ignominious death, right? To be beaten to death by peasants, that's fairly ignominious, right? This is not a noble, glorious death that he was, uh, that he was in order to warn Arthur, right? So therefore, he seems to be suggesting to Arthur, you are setting yourself up for an inglorious death. Secondly, Notice how he arranges this so that it's Arthur who saves him and how Arthur saves him, right? Just as Arthur himself, as night, comes in and scatters the churls, right? 
appropriately. He doesn't hit them. He doesn't strike them. He just tells them to flee and comes charging towards them and they scatter, right? Presumably, Merlin is suggesting that the dangers that are besetting Arthur could also be scattered, right? Could also be dispersed if he would act as a knight, right? Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm i not saying that I still even now get Merlin, you know, and what he does, uh, because I don't think I fully understand it. Um, but um, I... I do think that he, um, uh, we can see. The thing is, is that he, for all that he is very quick to explain exactly the future and what's going to happen. He doesn't sit down and parse things for us. I kind of wish Merlin would give us a good old fashioned parable exposition, right? Um, explain point by point the, the those churls those three churls represented this kind of thing happens a lot we will there will be a, a time in this book where we will get those kinds of things when external actions are going to be explicitly allegorized like that um it, when we get to the quest for the holy grail we're going to get that kind of thing a lot um and it seems like that's the kind of thing that merlin is doing here but he but he doesn't explain um <laughs> that's really that's really good. Um, Carita says nobody gets Merlin. Otherwise, he, he'd be out of a job. <laughs> Possibly so. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I, the weird ambiguity is fun. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But uh, but I, but I kind of, you know, part of me does wish for a nice little exposition. Anyway. Um, so what's Arthur doing wrong at the time? Uh, this is this is the point. Let me be quick to reassure you of a few things in this section of the text. This is the point where the story gets weird. And if you thought the story was getting weird and random and hard to follow, it's not you. Okay? It's not you. Um, Arthur's out hunting. Right? He's out hunting and he rides his horse to death and then he has this odd experience. And as he sat, as he sat so, yeah, that is, he's sitting in a, th- in, a, in, a, in a study, right? His horse has just died and he sent somebody off to go get him another horse. And he's sitting there contemplatively <laughs> next, to a, next to this well. And as he sat so, him thought he heard a noise of hundis to the sum of thirty. And with that the king saw come toward him the strangest beast that ever he saw or heard of. So this beast went to the well and drank, and the noise was in the beast's belly, like under the questing of thirty couple hundes. But all the while the beast drank, there was no noise in the beast's belly. And therewith the beast departed, with a great noise, whereof the king had great mervail. And so he was in a great thought, and therewith he fell on sleep, like you do. Right so, there come a knecht on foot unto Arthur, and said, Knecht, full of thought and sleepy, tell me if thou saw any strong beast pass this way. Sorry, I'm just pausing because I realize that totally needs to be my, like, Twitter description. Night full of thought and sleepy. Sorry. Uh, anyway. Um... <laughs> Uh, such on saw e, said King Arthur, that is past nigh to a mile. What wold ye with that beast? said Arthur. Sir, I have followed that beast long and killed mine horse, so wold God I had another to follow my quest. Reek so, come on with the king's horse. And when the knight saw the horse, he prayed the king to give him the horse, for I have followed this quest this twelfth month, and other I shall enchave him, or blood of the beast, blood of my body. Whose name was King Pellinor, that time king followed the questing beast, and after his death Sir Palamides followed it. Our first reference to Sir Palamides. Um, uh, okay, so... 
Yes. Yes, Karina, you're reading it right. 30 couple, uh, 30, cu- 60 hounds. Yes. Uh, 60 total hounds. Uh, and of course, questing is a little bit confusing here, right? Um, it's, I think, a common mistake to think that the questing beast means like the beast that you go on a quest for or that the beast is in maybe in some sense himself on a quest or something like that. That is not the case, right? He is called the questing beast because of the sound that he makes. Uh, when hounds cry on the scent, they are, that's, they're, they're questing. That's the description of the noise that hounds make when they are on the scent, um, when they are hunting. Uh, uh, when they're searching for the scent. Um, and uh, so it, that's why it says like under the questing of 30 couple hounds. Um, so anyway, yeah. So so th- he's called the questing beast because he makes this really weird noise. He doesn't make the noise while he's drinking, right? But he makes the noise before and after he drinks. Um, how does he make a noise that sounds like 60 hounds? Why does he make a noise that sounds like 60, 60 hounds? What on earth is this beast? And what does he look like even? We're told what he sounds like and that it's the strangest beast that ever he saw or heard of, but we get no description, right? Only of the sound. We get no, we get no visual description of this beast at all. Um, and so, I would add, on the subject of my wishing for allegorical exposition, um, as somebody who really likes medieval allegory, and I really do, <clears throat> the questing beast sounds like an allegorical figure. I mean, like this beast is screaming out for an allegorical interpretation. Okay, I mean, I, 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 I can't, I can barely help myself. Um, I want to do an allegorical reading of the questing beast. Mallory seems utterly impervious to this impulse. Utterly impervious to this impulse. Um, we get nothing. We don't even get any kinds of details that we can use. Um, and that's um, a kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> Stephen says it's screaming for allegorical interpretation, but not when it's drinking. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, um, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, Sarah Grant is wondering, can it be a coincidence that people keep questing for it? Well, uh, well, no, not a coincidence per se. Um, uh, I assume, I assume that King Pelinor is planning to kill it, you know, to fight it and kill it, though he says I shall achieve him, Right. He's going to achieve the questing beast. That almost certainly means he's going to kill it, right? Uh, And bring its head. Heads? How many heads does it have? What does its head look like? I have no idea. Um, But anyway, he's going to... Because he does talk about bleeding the best blood of his body. Um, A great phrase there as well. Um, So presumably, you know, he he imagines himself in a life or death struggle with the beast. Um, But, uh, uh, yeah... Anyway, um, Tara says perhaps Mallory shares Tolkien's dislike of our allegory. Possibly. He's going to do some later on, but he can't avoid it when he does the quest for the Holy Grail. It's not entirely his fault. Um, but um, Okay, so big picture here. What is going on here and why do we care? On the one hand, we're getting a marvel. And that's fine, right? We don't need, like, the fact that marvels occur um, and notice the, you know, the, like, it, he's, he has great marvile, right? Um, this is a marvel. And we have great marvile about this. And we don't, we're not going to learn too much more about this. Spoiler, we're not going to, this is not, this is, you know, one of those things where, like, an incident like this might trigger your, like, you know, novel reading experience where you're like, okay, the questing beast is going to come out to be really important later on. Nah, it's not. <laughs> He's barely ever going to come up again, actually. Uh, so on the one hand, it's just a sort of a free range marvel. But on the other hand, um, 
Notice in this section what we get from the moment King Arthur goes hunting here and through almost the entire rest of this section. We are seeing Arthur in a completely different context. We saw Arthur as political figure, right? The emphasis on him being the the right wise king born of England, pulling the sword from the stone again and again and again, you know, all the way through the church calendar in front of thousands of witnesses and then confronted by the 11 kings who wouldn't submit to him and him uh, making a, a alliance with Bannon Boers and bringing them into submission, right? Or at least cowing them into running away and ceasing to oppose him. So that was like the first story of King Arthur that we get. Now we're getting King Arthur as the individual knight, right? We're seeing him acting independently. And here's he without a horse and here's Pelinor without a horse. They've both been hunting and both of them have ridden their horses to death. Arthur is just chasing a deer and he almost gets it, but it gets away, right? But his horse dies. And so he's sitting there kind of lamely in the middle of the woods while he's waiting for somebody to bring him another horse, right? Pelinor has got places to be, right? Pelinor is also hunting game, but Pelinor is hunting cooler game by far than Arthur is hunting, right? He um, has been pursuing this beast for a 12 month, right? And is not just sitting there and taking a nap. So Pelinor is cutting a much greater figure here uh, as a knight errant, uh, than Arthur is. And notice how Arthur seems to be aware of this. What does Arthur do? Arthur says, hey, um, I'm, um, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll follow him. Tell you what, you tag me and I'll follow him for another year for you, right? And King Pelinor's like, no way, man. You know, this is my marvel. I'm after it. Um, and King Pelinor takes his horse, right? The guy shows up with Arthur's horse and King Pelinor takes his horse, says Gramercy and rides off. And then there's Arthur <laughs> has to still sit there and wait for the guy to bring him another horse now uh, at this point. Um, uh, Tony, I think, uh, I think that the similarity between King Pelinor's name and the name of the Pelinor Fields is one of those Cinderin coincidences uh, that I, I, I can't imagine Tolkien was thinking of. Not impossible, I guess, but I'd be very surprised. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, Curtis. There's no Chekhov's questing beast that reappears in the third act. It's definitely, that's, that's not, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, Dave is wondering, does riding his horse to death show another of Arthur's character flaws? Uh, possibly so. Yeah. <laughs> Tarloni was saying it was, it was pretty perilous being a horse in Britain in these days. Uh, yeah, it's certainly true. Um, you know, I'm not sure that it does. I'm not 100 percent sure that it does, but I actually kind of think that it is a bit of a knock against Arthur. Right. Or, David, let me come at that another way. This image of Arthur sitting there in the woods, waiting, helpless, pointless, right, um, powerless to do almost anything other than watch this marvel come through um, because he doesn't have his horse, because he rode it to death, I think that that's not good, right? Um, it's not to say that a good knight will never ride a horse to death. Sometimes it happens. Um, but um, but not for that. King Pelnor has ridden his horse to death too. But why? Because he's this close, man, to achieving the questing beast that he's been following for 12 months. And now, like, he just barely got away. The death of King Pelinor's horse, so much more understandable than the death of Arthur's uh, horse. Um, and yes, Catriona, it's another instance where he wouldn't just... He now wasn't a now, right, uh, for Arthur. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Horses in Mallory seem to fare as bad as ponies in The Hobbit. Almost. Not quite so bad. Uh, the mortality rate isn't exactly as high, but it's uh, it's reminiscent. Um, notice how King Pelinor is established as a kind of um, as a kind of foil to King Arthur. Right. Both of them are kings. Both of them are kings on individual questing adventures, except Pelinor's is awesome and Arthur's is lame and our, and Pelinor is going to ride off on, on Arthur's horse, right? Um, there's a kind of rivalry, there's a kind of measuring that's uh, being established here, it seems. Um, 
Oh, let's keep going here. Um, so when he meets, so it's on his way to fight King Pelinor that Arthur is um, uh, meets our, uh, Merlin when he's disguised himself, or not disguised himself, when he's arranged his being chased by the churls. Uh, and he tells him that he's going off and God is not his friend. But Arthur insists he's going to go and fight with King Pelinor. He's gonna he's gonna measure himself against King Pelinar, right? So at the last they smote to getters, that both here sweared is met even to getters, but King Arthur's sweared brack in two paces, wherefore he was heavy. Then sighed the knight unto Arthur, thou art in my danger, whether may list to save thee or slay thee, but thou wilt, and but thou yield thee to me as overcome and recreant. Thou shalt die. You see the if clause again there. And, but thou yield thyself, right? Um, and unless you yield yourself to me, thou shalt die. As for that, said King Arthur, death is welcome to me when it cometh. But to yield me unto thee, but to, yet yeah, to yield me unto thee, I will not. And therewithal the king leapt unto King Pellinor, and took him by the middle, and overthrew him, and rasped off his helm. So Juan the Knecht felt that he was a drad, for he was a passing big man of meekt. And so forthwith he wroth Arthur under him, and rasped off his helm, and would have smitten off his head. And therewithal come Merlion, and said, Knecht, hold thee hond, for an thou slay that Knecht, thou puttest this realm in the greatest damage that ever was realm, for this Knecht is a man of more worship than thou wottest of. Why, what is he? said the Knecht. For it is King Arthur, said Merlion. Then would he have slain him for dread of his wrath, and so he lift up his sword, and therewith Merlion cast an enchantment on the Knecht, that he fell to the earth in a great sleep. All right. Um, David Urbach, yes, heavy means uh, heavy-hearted, sad. Uh, you know, his sword breaks in two pieces and he's seriously bummed about that. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Um, uh, what was the thing I wanted to... There was something at the beginning. Oh, yes, really interesting piece of vocabulary here. Danger. Danger is important. Um then said the Knecht unto Arthur, Thou art in my danger. Um, if you are in somebody's danger, it means they have control over you, right? It, so if you're in somebody's danger, it means they are the boss of you, okay? Um, uh, danger, and this is an important word in... Uh, medieval love poetry, very important word um, in in medieval love poetry because to be in somebody's danger, it means they're the boss of you, but that can manifest itself in two ways, right? Um, if you're in somebody's danger, it means they can they can hurt you if they choose, right? Uh, they can give you things you don't want, like pain, death, uh, horrible maims, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're in somebody's danger, it also means they can withhold something from you that you need, right? Um, it is in that sense that the word danger is so frequently used, especially in, uh, in, in French and Anglo-French um, medieval love poetry. Um, danger. Uh, a, a woman is described as being dangereuse, uh, meaning uh, she, is, she is powerful. Uh, she has power of you. She, uh, she's the boss of you because you want something that she is withholding from you, right? Um, so when you say don't be dangerous, it doesn't mean that like she's going to like, you know, whoop up on you. It means that she's uh, has the power to withhold from you and is exerting her power to withhold something from you that you want. Um, uh, but anyway, but, to, but so to be in somebody's danger is a, is a, is an important concept, um, which again generally means they are the boss; they have the power over you. Um, so recreant. Oh, sorry. Let me, uh, Lynn. Let me start with that one. Wattest of uh, this Knecht is a man of more worship than thou wattest of. Wattest the i s t ending is just the second person singular ending. Uh, thou wattest. Um, I wot, thou wottest, 
uh, hey, shay, hit, whateth, um, or what, actually. Um, and uh, the uh, th- that just means to know. That's to wit, to know, um, what, wist, same verb. We've, we've seen this verb in a couple places. Super important verb. It means to know, right? So this is a man of more worship than you know, is literally what, what, what Merlin says there. Um, now, recreant. Um, I'm not sure I can give you the etymology of that word. It's obviously a French word. Um, but, uh, let's see, uh, yield to me as overcome and recreant. Um, that just means that you are, you are, so to be, to proclaim yourself as recreant, notice how he says, yield thee to me as overcome and recreant. Um, so overcome just means acknowledge that I beat you, yield to me, right? Yield yourself to me. Recreant, there's a moral dimension there, okay? Uh, that is to say, this isn't a legal combat or anything, right? This isn't a, a, this isn't a judicial combat that's happening here. But there's still an element of, if I win, it proves that I'm in the right and you're in the wrong, Right? And so to be declared recreant um, also does carry with it, when we see Maori using that word, it carries with it that sense of, you know, I, I, yes, I have yielded to you. And that, that is, that is, I mean, that's, that's, that's the essential meaning of it. But, but it does convey this sense of, I, I was, I have been beaten. I was wrong almost, um, yeah. Anyway, um, we will, uh, uh, because recreant is often used as an insult when a knight acts in a dishonorable way. Um, like uh, he will be called a recreant knight, whether he's been defeated yet or not. Right. I'm going to prove that you're a recreant by defeating you. Um, so it, it does, it does definitely, um, suggest a, um, a, a, a you know, to, 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 to sh- again, to sort of show that you're in the wrong. It's hard because here they weren't exactly fighting over anything exactly. Um, but, um, yeah, Tim Doff says that uh, OED says it means cowardly. Sure, yeah. I mean, that seems associated with it also. Um, dishonorable, yeah. Um, uh, best thing to do with this is with everything else. Don't go with external definitions form an internal definition, right? Let's just notice how it's used uh, and build up a definition. Because the best thing we can do, if we want to know what Maori means by recreant, the best thing we can do is not look up how other people used it elsewhere, but to see how Maori uses it himself, right? Um, but anyway, uh, it's this is clearly, Arthur doesn't, uh, um, doesn't want to, will not yield himself, right? He will not declare himself recreant. Um, Notice Arthur's response, death is welcome to me, right? But to yield unto me unto you, I will not. I would rather die than yield me unto you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. There was another question up here. Um, Yes, for and thou, uh, Hawthorne, for and thou slay that knight. Um, for if you slay that knight, yeah. So, so and is used as a as you know, meaning if, right? And but, right? And but thou yield thee to me means unless, and unless you yield me to thee, yeah, yeah. Fun with pseudo conjunctions, right? <clears throat> uh, in today's reading. Oh, the uh, the punctuation is editorial, Oliver. Yeah. Yeah, the punctuation is editorial. That's um, that's Vinaver's punctuation, which means you can doubt the punctuation if you choose. And there may be some places where you disagree with Vinaver's punctuation. That is possible. Always something to keep in mind. An excellent question. 
Okay. Um, yeah, good. Okay. Um, yeah, good. Let's keep going. Oh, notice how Moron is doing almost the same thing with King Pelinor that he did with Arthur, right? Um, he could have just enchanted King Pelinor to start with, right? But notice instead he tries to get him to do the right thing, right? Hey, that's King Arthur. Please don't kill him, right? That'd be bad. And and King, King Pelinor's like, oh, it's King Arthur? I'm totally killing him then, right? And notice why he's going to totally kill him, because if he doesn't kill him, he, Arthur, is going to be angry at him, that he fears the wrath of King Arthur. So uh, I'd better kill him. I'd be safer, right, if he's dead at this point. Um... So he's going to go and kill him, and uh, and Merlin has to enchant him, Pelinor, that is, in order to stop him. He could have just done it anyway, but he, you know, kind of, you know, gives this, it's like a teachable moment here with King Pelinor, but King Pelinor seems to fail that one as well. Okay, more on Merlin. So, Merlin's disguises. Merlin has appeared as a 14-year-old boy uh, to Arthur and told him that his father is Uther Pendragon and his mom is Igraine, right? I will not believe they, said Arthur, and he was wroth with the child, right? The child, this 14-year-old child just said he knew his dad, right? And he knows better than anybody else who Arthur's father and mother are. And Arthur's like, whatever, kid. Yeah, how could you possibly know my dad? So departed Merlion, and come again in the likeness of an old man of fourscore year of age, whereof the king was passing glad, for he seemed to be right wise. Then said the old man, Why are ye so sad? I may well be sad, said Arthur, for money thingus. For Rick knew there was a child here, and told me money thingus that meseemeth he should not knew, for he was not of age to know my father. Yes, said the old man, the child told you truth, and more he would have told you, and ye would have suffered him. But ye have done a thing lot that God is displeased with you, for ye have lion by your sister, and on here ye have gotten a child that shall destroy you and all the connectives of your realm. What are ye, said Arthur, that ye that tell me these tidings? Sir, I am Merlion. And I was he in the child's likeness. Ah, said the king, ye are a marvellous man, but I marvel much of thy word is that I may die in battle. Marvel not, said Merlion, for it is God's will that your body shall be punished for your foul deeds. But I ought ever to be heavy, said Merlion, for I shall die a shamful death to be put in the earth quick, and ye shall die a worshipful death. All right. Um, <laughs> so, um, forget about the art, the Uther and Agrain stuff for now. Just, I, I, we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, let's just focus on Merlin and Arthur here, right? Um, What's the point? Why is he doing this? Um, notice how he first disguises himself twice, and then he reveals not only who he is now, but that he was before, right? And notice the important if clause that he adds, right? Um, the child told you truth. And more he would have told you, and ye would have suffered him. But ye have done a thing lot that God is displeased with you. The child, if you had not scoffed at the child, if you had not been so wrath with the child, so wroth with the child, I should say, sorry, not shown so much wrath. Wrath is the noun, wrath is the adjective. Um, if you had not been so wroth with the child, um, he would have told you more, right? Notice Arthur's... Notice how dominated Arthur is by appearances here, right? 
he sees this 14 year old kid and he wants nothing to do with the 14 year old kid, right? Don't you talk to me, kid. You don't, you can't know any of this stuff. You better shut up right now. And then an 80 year old comes in, right? An 80 year old guy. And as soon as he sees him, the king is passing glad, right? Oh, awesome, right? Here's a right wise old man, right? Okay, I get, you know. And then as soon as he comes in, Arthur starts sharing, right? I may well be sad for many fingers. For like, there was this kid, you understand this old man, right? There was this kid here and he was annoying and he claimed to know all this stuff. And I'm like, what do you know, right? Like, you get that all the time, don't you, old man, right? Um, Arthur is completely, um, uh, um, uh, he's very superficial, right? He, he refuses to listen to what the 14-year-old kid tells him because it's told him by a 14-year-old kid. Merlin is amazingly indirect, right? Um, I mean, he goes to a, in astounding lengths not to tell Arthur things, right? I mean, this whole thing has been played out by Merlin, and in the end, you'll notice he tells him, like, well, if you'd asked the 14-year-old, he'd have told you more stuff. He is the 14 year old, right? He could still tell Arthur whatever he's going to tell him, but he's not. He's like, no, can't tell you now, right? But if you had, if you had asked of the 14 year old, I'd have told you, right? It's like a worthiness test, which Arthur has failed. Um, because Arthur dismissed the 14 year old child, didn't, is it, is, is, is Merlin mad because he didn't see through it? Like that he's not wise enough to suspect that this 14 year old kid is, is perhaps, uh, you know, somebody in disguise, like maybe Merlin himself. Um, or is it just like, because you are so quick to judge by appearances and to look down upon others who are, uh, you know, sort of weaker and younger than you, um, you know, that like, therefore you don't, you don't get the cookie, right? You, I'm not going to tell you the thing that I would have told you, uh, had you, had you, past this um and um jeffrey and uh uh somebody was asking this before carita before no idea i have no idea how old arthur is here and the primary reason i have no idea is that we're in a different story now right um before we meet merlin here we should have somebody coming out with one of those hollywood things like you know King Arthur learns his identity, take two, you know, off we go. New story, right? New story. No idea. There is I, no continuity. There's no obvious continuity. I can't think of anything apart from his name and his relationship with Merlin that connects this Arthur with the Arthur that we met at the beginning of the story. The Arthur, who is given away by Uther Pendragon and raised by Ector, the foster brother of Kay, and who pulls the sword out of the stone as a young man. This is this is Arthur M Mark II. Okay? Um, and uh, so we, and I literally know no background. Um, the sword that Arthur broke when he was fighting with Pelinor. That's not the sword that he took out of this. There's no evidence that this Arthur has ever taken a sword out of a stone, right? And you can tell on account of how he's about to get Excalibur again a second time, but this time in a different way. So we have one, so we have two totally separate versions of the story, right? One in which the emphasis was on the political continuity, right? Sort of the political reveal. Um, this is the son of Uther Pendragon, publicly proclaimed as rightwise king born of all England by the drawing out of the stone. This story is a different story, right? Um, now, it might have been nice had Mallory explained that a little bit more explicitly, but it's pretty clear when you read it that that's what's going on here. We're getting a different version here. Um, this is a kind of... this is. No, not kind of. This is the most extreme example of Maori's 
lack of uh, his deprioritization of continuity, right? He's not bothered about continuity. And there's no bigger example of that than here in this passage. Um, even now, I mean, even just today when I was rereading the passage, I misread that first line. I will not believe they, right? I'm like, well, okay, hang on a second. Oh, that's right. Sure. He's probably, when he says, I won't believe thee to the 14 year old boy, he means, I don't believe you that you knew my father. Right. But he's not saying, I don't believe you that Uther Pendragon is my father. Right. I mean, he knows that obviously. Um, and then I like turn over to the next page. And I'm like, oh no, wait, I forgot again. He did forget. Like he doesn't know. In fact, somehow he doesn't know. Um, it's just, it's just a different, it's just a different story. Um, it is, um, well, actually, let's just go on and read the next bit, and then I'll come back and talk about this a little bit more again. So in all hast, the queen was sent for, and she come, and she brought with her Morgan Le Fay, her doctor, that was a fire, that was a, a, as fire a laddie as any micht be. Micht be, sorry. And I'm getting a little bit better at my middle English, at my Maori pronunciation. I'm, I'm, I'm doing Chaucer less often, but it's still not perfect. And the king welcomed de grind in the best manner. Rixo come in Olfans, and said openly that the king and all meeked here that were fested that day. Ye are the falsest laddie of the world, and the most traitorous unto the king's person. Beware, said King Arthur. What thou sayst? Thou spakest a great word. Sir, I am well ware said Alphonse, what I spake, and here is my glove to prove it upon any man that will say the contrary, that this Queen Igrain is the causer of your great war, for an she will have uttered it in the life of Uther of the birth of you, and who ye were begotten, then had ye never had the mortal wars that ye have had. For the most party of your baroness of your realm knew never who son ye were, ne of whom ye were begotten, and she that bar you of his body shall should have made it known openly in excusing of here worship and yours, and in likewise to all the realm. Wherefore, I pray her false to God and to you and to all your realm. And who will say the contrary, I will prove it on his body. Now, she's acquitted of this charge, right? Ophius doesn't actually even do his combat, um, she explains she didn't know who he was. He was taken away by Merlin. And Olfin's like, then it's Merlin's fault! And Merlin gets out of it, right? And nobody has to fight anybody. Um, yeah, Nancy says, I honestly think she would have preferred to have done all those things if Merlin didn't stop her. Yes, yes, agreed. So, what's going on here? All of this has already been revealed, right? Why are, why is Arthur surprised now, right? And he brings in Hector and he brings in a grand and he's like, tell me the real story that I've already learned, you know, uh, a bunch of pages ago. Um, so again, like, what are we, what are we getting here? Um, again, no evidence that we get the sword in the stone here. What we are getting is two different versions of the, you know, two different stories of like the early kingship of Arthur. Um, and they're interested in different things, right? The first story, the story of the sword and the stone is one that's interested in like Arthur as king ordained by God, right? Declared publicly, affirmed by the commons, opposed by some of the barons, right? Opposed by those kings, but not, um, not... Uh, but ultimately not really in question, right? Here we seem to have Arthur established. Um, I said that Mallory doesn't care at all for continuity. That's not quite true. There are some gestures towards continuity here, right? As if, like, Ulfius is speaking as if the war with the Eleven Kings is just in the past, right? Um, but yet this whole conversation is kind of deeply weird and confusing, because it's already been revealed before, and Arthur certainly knew who his dad was, um, and uh, uh, that ha this has not been a, this has not been a mystery. But yet, so again, we get, we get all these all these inconsistencies. But again, at the end of the day, what what we're getting are two different versions of this story. What this one is interested in, right? This is interested in in who knew what, in the surprise revelations, and how did this story come about? How is it that Arthur 
comes to be a surprise to the throne. Why doesn't everybody know, right? Um, when, you know, in the first story, we get Uther's public declaration at the time of his death, right, about his heir and officially naming Arthur his heir and everything else. Um, Tarlonio says, or wait, maybe this is how it happened. Something like that. Something like that. Um, I, uh, um, it is a little bit like alternate universe retelling, um, both Jennifer and, 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 and Hawthorne are thinking that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so this, I think, is simply Mallory trying to kind of have his cake and eat it too. There are the, so like two different ways that the story of Arthur and his parentage and his coming to power and his understanding how he fits and everything are two ways that that can be done, right? Two different versions of Arthur's story. Mallory wants to do them both with a very kind of loose and unsatisfying uh, continuity established between the two of them. Um, Sarah uh, Yassin is asking, it, it would, a, would, a, would a transition... Um, between these separate versions of the story have been inartful. Um, I, well, Sarah, to be brutally honest, I think that the, the, the way that he's done it is kind of inartful, honestly. Um, I mean, I've said that medieval stories are not so worried about continuity as modern stories are, and that's generally true. Um, but, this is just kind of confusing. This is not very well done. Um, we will see him integrating alternate versions of, of you know, multiple alternate versions of the story, uh, melding those together into one really brilliantly unified story later on. Right? He'll get there, and he'll get really, really good at this. This, this is pretty clumsy, right? Um, and it seems very likely he's working with two different texts here, and he wants to bring in uh, these two different versions of the story. Um, that's, um, that's what he wants to do. Right. Um, and it's fine. So we just, our job, our job is to be flexible, right? Just roll with it. Just roll with it. Don't insist. Don't get offended. Just, just hang on. Just hang on. Um, yeah. Well, we can't we can't move on without the strange women lying in ponds distributing swords. And as they rode, Arthur sighed. I have no sword, no force, said Merlin. Um, that means don't worry about it, or it's not a big deal, or uh, you know, it's uh, like it is of no force. That thing that you've just said has no force, right? Uh, it's fine. No force. By the way, that's another phrase I really like to bring back. Uh, I do sometimes try to work that one into conversation. No force. Uh, no force, said Merlion. Hereby is a swear that shall be your, and I may. So they rode till they come to a lock that was a fire water and broad. And in the midst, Arthur was war of an arm clothed in white samite that held a fire sword in that hand. Lo, said Merlion, yonder is the sword that I spoke of. So with that they saw a damsel going upon the lock. What damsel is that? said Arthur. That is the lady of the lock, said Merlion. There is a great rock, and therein is as fire a palace as any on earth, and richly beseen. And this damsel will come to you anon, and thon spake ye fire to hear, that she may give you that sword. So anon come this damsel to Arthur, and salute him, and he here again. Damazel, said Arthur, what swear is that yonder that the arm holdeth above the water? I wold it were mine, for I have no swear. Sir Arthur, said the damsel, that swear is mine, and, and if ye will give me a gift when I ask it you, ye shall have it. By my faith, said Arthur, I will give you what gift ye will ask. Well, said the damsel, Go ye unto yonder barge, and row yourself to the sword, and tuck it and the scalbard with you, and I will ask my gift when I see my time. All right. Um, uh, 
Bruce, the arm clothed in white Samite. That is, of course, what Money Python is quoting here. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, it, 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 that absolutely should make you think uh, of uh, of Money Python because they're all practically quoting Mallory in that description. Um, yeah, good. James, I agree. He doesn't say the gift must be within reason. Yeah, Stephen says, I'll give the fairy whatever she wants to be declared later. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, no, that's not really good. Um, and David, I also believe with you that the woman is walking on the water here. I, I, I do suspect that she's walking across the water. Should we be worried by that? Well, you know... If we're going to if we're going to bicker and argue about who's water, walking on the water here, um, well, let's just say that's not the biggest issue we've got to swallow here. Um, she's going on the lake and there's that. Um, but there's also the fairy mound over there with the palace inside it, we're told by Merlin uh, and the arm with the sword uh, and the gift. And the, this is a this is a very, a very, a very fairy moment. Right. So notice the two very different contexts that we are being given through these two alternate stories, the two contexts of Arthur and his sword, right? Arthur's sword Excalibur was the sword taken from the stone, the sword that was miraculously appeared in the courtyard of the church when the archbishop is leading the Christmas service for all of the nobles of the realm inside the great church, whether it's St. Paul's or somebody else, I don't know. Um, the divine miracle right that shows that he is the that he is the king here we get absolutely total pagan fairy context right here's a fairy there's a fairy sword here comes the fairy who owns the sword she lives in that fairy mound out on that island in the middle of the lake who is she oh she's called the lady of the lake right um and she's going to ask you a gift, which she's going to name later. And she'll give you this thing that you want only if you agree to give her whatever she wants later on. Um, and there you are. Right? No reconciliation, no explicit, um, uh, no explicit connection between them as ever. We're given these two alternative versions, right? Uh, the two places, the two things that are associated with Arthur's sword, the divine miracle the fairy gift. And Maori doesn't, he does not choose to choose between those two things. He just gives them both to us. Um, and that's, um, that's how Maori rolls, right? We learn a lot about Maori just from looking at that one fact, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, then King Arthur looked on the sword and liked it passing well. Then said Merlion, Whither like ye better, the sword or the scalbard? I like better the sword, said Arthur. Ye are more unwise, for the scalbard is worth ten of the sword. For whiles ye have the scalbard upon you, ye shall lose no blood, be ye never so sore wounded. Therefore keep well the scalbard always with you. Okay, so Excalibur has a magic scabbard, a magic scabbard which, while you're wearing it, will it will make sure that you lose no blood. Mind, it doesn't mean you're not, you can't be wounded. You can be wounded. You just won't bleed, right? Um, so this, of course, is very important, as we'll see. The knights are going to get all bled all over the place uh, during combat. So if you can uh, contrive not to, uh, um, if you can contrive not to, uh, not to bleed during combat, you're in a you're in pretty good shape. Um, yeah, Curtis thinks that Merlin is undervaluing the scabbard. Quite possibly. Well, the sword is pretty cool. I mean, no, no, uh, no two ways about that. But Tara, you're right. Here, poor Arthur fails yet another test that Merlin gives him. Right. Um, notice how few. Um, notice how few of Merlin's tests Arthur passes. Right. Um, and he doesn't seem to be improving, right? Uh, he just keeps failing and just keeps failing. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, David. You won't go faint with blood loss during the battle, which is a huge deal, right? Big advantage. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Um, this little tidbit, of course, is going to be important before too long. All right. Let's look briefly. I know we're over time here, but we can look at these briefly here at least. Um, Arthur's love affairs. Um, number one. Than in the meanwhile, there come a damsel that was an airless doctor. His name was Sanam, and her name was Leonor's, a passing fair damsel. And so she come thither for to do homage, as other lord is dead after that great battle. And King Arthur set his love greatly on her, and so did she upon him. And so the king had a do with her, and gate on her a child. And his name was Bor, that was after a god connect of the table ruined. The end. That's it. We get no further discussion or commentary of Arthur's fling with Leonor's the passing fair damsel daughter of Sanam the Earl. He does beget a bastard son, Bor, who is a bastard, so, you know, he, he can't inherit or anything, but, you know, goes on to be a good knight. So, first point I'll emphasize here. Um, what are we supposed to do with this? I've urged us to be on the lookout for the kinds of cues that the text gives us, right? To try to withhold our own judgments and see how does the text seem to be pushing us. But this is a tough one, isn't it? How are we supposed to feel about this? Is this is this is this bad? I mean, they're not married. Does that make it bad? Is it okay? Seems to be consensual, right? He's into her, she's into him. They have a do, right? Beget a child. He grows up and lives a constructive life, right? Who gets hurt? I guess, right? It's hard to see any obvious censure here, right? Arthur is unchaste. Absolutely, Jeffrey. And that seems like that's bad, right? I guess. Probably. Um... Tom says he's certainly acting like a king. Yeah, Tom, and he's acting like a particular king, right? <laughs> he's acting like his dad, in fact. Uh, this is just how Uther Pendragon was kind of hoping the Holy Grain thing was going to go, right? He saw her and he was into her, but unfortunately that's where it broke down, right? Um, yeah. Um, well, let's look at the next data point. Then after the departing of King Ban and Bors, King Arthur rode unto the city of Carleon, and thither came unto him King Lot's wife of Orkney, in manner of a message. But she was sent thither to espy the court of King Arthur, and she come richly besane, with her four sonnes, Gawain, Gaheris, Agravine, and Gareth, with many other knictes and laddies, for she was a passing fire laddie. Wherefore the king cast great love unto her, and desired to lie by her. Notice almost exactly word for word what we got with Uther and Agrain at the beginning. And so they were agreed and he begat upon here Sir Mordred. And she was sister on the Modder's side, Igraine, unto Arthur. So there she rested here a month, and at the last she departed. Than the king dreamed a marvellous dream, whereof he was sore adrad. But all this time King Arthur knew not that the king Lot's wife was his sister. But thus was the dream of Arthur. Him thought there was come unto his, into his land griffins and serpentes, and him thought they brent and slew all the people in the land. And one he thought he, f and than he thought he fought with them, and they did him great harm and wounded him full of sore. But at the last he slew him. 
Okay. Um, yeah, Caritas notices that uh, that Morgaz here is passing fair, but not passing wise, whereas Igraine was both, right? Yeah, yeah, Carita. That's It does seem to be the wisdom. Uh, what's the difference, right? We've got Igraine, uh, Leonors, and Morgaz, all in the same position, right? Married ladies... Well, no, Leonors was not married, but anyway... Ladies who come to the court and whom the king feels great love towards. Notice, by the way, the 100% correlation so far between love and sexual desire, right? There's nothing flowery about love here. Every time so far we have seen him use the word love, it means, uh, it means he had great sexual desire for her, right? Um, anyway, okay, so... Um, but so of those three, Karita, just as you're suggesting, it's the wise woman who said no, right? And who said, husband, we better get out of here or there's going to be trouble. Um, okay. Now, there's... Uh, we have these three situations and they're very similar to each other, right? Let's leave the first one for a second. Uther and a grain, I mean. Um, and just think of Arthur's two relationships here, right? Earl, with beautiful young daughter, comes to the court. He's into her. She's into him. They have a do. She bears a son. Nobody gets hurt. King Lot's wife comes to the court. He's into her. She seems into him. They... Have a do consensually. She bears a son. It is an utter catastrophe, and as a consequence, God is not his friend. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? Now, on the one hand, no question, this is incest, and it's a big deal, right? Um, that's a big deal. But notice how. Uh, yes, it's incest and, right, A, incest, B, adultery. Yes, true. Um, but notice nobody seems to be too terribly bothered about the adultery bit. Um, but anyway, um, notice how far Mallory's gone out of his way down here. But all this time... King Arthur knew not that King Lotte's wife was his sister. Uh, Mallory absolutely and strenuously insists on Arthur's ignorance, right? It was in ignorance that he did it, right? He didn't know she was his sister. He thought she was just another, you know, beautiful noblewoman come to his court that he had a fancy for and who seemed into him too. Notice both of his... Again, both of his relationships, Arthur's here, have been consensual. This is not an exploitation of power. It doesn't seem obviously to be. This doesn't seem to be like, uh, like I'm just kind of grazing among the women at my court. Um, very explicitly with Leonor's at the beginning. Now, notice it doesn't say that Morgaz loved him, right? Um, the king cast great love unto her and desired to lie by her. And so they were agreed, right? She agrees with him. She explicitly consents unto this. It doesn't say that she wanted him, right? With Leonor's, it does. He was into her. She was into him, right? Um, but it's a big deal. Um, so... Tony, you're right, actually. Uh, Tony points out that as a side, as a sidebar, one of the things that we see f about from this is the virility of the king, right? Uh, uh, he's, he seems to have had sex twice, and he's two for two on the begetting of sons, right? Uh, that's, that, that, is, that is not an insignificant uh, fact, I agree. Um, what I'm trying to understand here is... I'm trying to understand how we are meant to be reacting to this. This is disastrous. In 
committing this act of incest, Arthur has doomed his kingdom. He's, it's not just that he's committed a sin and that God is angry at him for it. I mean, that's true, but it's not just that, right? I mean, this is doom. He has his portentous dream, right? Which, uh, in which he's going to be triumphant. He's going to kill the griffins and serpents, right? Um, but they're going to, they're going to destroy his land. Um, <laughs> Curtis says, I don't know that we can assume he's only had sex twice. No, he's only had sex that we know of twice, but that both of the times it has been. In. But, but Curtis, we also don't know whether or not any other sex he might have had resulted in children, right? So, um, uh, but Jennifer, that's exactly my question too. Jennifer says, but he didn't know. How could it be a sin if he didn't know it was incest? Now, it's still adultery. Uh, granted, granted. But but again, how big of a deal is that, right? I know. I know it's a sin. I get it. Like, the Bible's very clear on this subject. But so what, right? That doesn't prove that, according to the values of this text, we're supposed to care a great deal about that, right? As a, as a moral thing, as a spiritual thing. Um. It may be, but we've not seen much evidence for that yet. That doesn't seem to be the issue with Egrain, right? Uh, and Uther. That doesn't really seem to come up much. Um, again, that's that one is so different because it's it's um, it's non consensual, right? Uh, at least at first. Um, Carrie says. Putting blame is not important. Following consequences is the important part. I agree that... Um, but see, Carrie, here's, here's my problem. Merlin is lavish with the blame, right? God is not your friend for what you did. And he explicitly makes it clear. Because you lay with your sister and got a son on her, God is not your friend anymore. Um... It does seem that this horrible consequence has come about because of what Arthur did. He didn't know that it was incest. He didn't knowingly commit incest. He didn't say, she's my sister, but she's really cute, so I don't care. But the Hawthorne, that's exactly, um, that's exactly where I end up going with this. Um, says it's the repeated offense. He had a bastard and it ends up fine. But maybe there was a lesson he was supposed to learn the first time. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, the, to me, the first, the description of this first love affair is almost completely free of judging, <laughs> right? We get almost no moral cues about how to respond to this. Um, I literally, I read this paragraph and I'm like, uh, okay, where are we now? Right? Am I supposed to be outraged? Am I supposed to be worried? Am I supposed to be cheering? How am I supposed to be? I'm not giving any cues about how I'm supposed to be. Here, the griffins and serpents, I've got cues. Right? This is bad. From Arthur's point of view, he did the same thing both times. Right? Practically the same. This one was married and the other one was not married. So again, maybe you can say it's the adultery that should have clued him in. Right? Maybe. Maybe. Um... Uh, Igraine makes me less certain about that, but possibly, possibly. Um, but, um, uh, but to me, this second instance coupled with the insistence on Arthur's, if, uh, if, um, um, if he, um, if, Mallory were not so insistent on Arthur's ignorance, then I would think that that's where the difference lay, right? Like, you know, I, I, if, if he knew that she was his sister and just didn't care, then, I, then to me it would be clear. It'd be like, okay, beautiful young Earl's daughter comes to court, no harm, no foul. Uh, your sister comes to court, don't go there, right? 
he didn't cross any huge lines the first time, he does cross a huge line the second time. That'd be clear, right? But again, from Arthur's point of view, there is not very much difference, right, between the two of them. And so either the difference that there is is hugely important, namely the adultery, but the adultery is never emphasized. Nowhere does it say, you had slept with King Lot's wife, that's awful. Right? Instead, it says you slept with your sister. That's what's awful. It's the incest. Where, I, I mean, maybe it is and I'm missing it. Where does it emphasize? The, in, the, the adultery. Nobody talks about the adultery. The adultery is not the issue. The incest is the issue. And of that, he was ignorant. And so, therefore, I can't help but come away um, with thinking that this suggests that his first act, too, the begetting of, of the having a do with Leonor's was also probably not a good thing. And what do we see? We see a pattern here in Arthur's behavior, right? Um, Arthur has like id problems, right? He wants to, he doesn't, he, he doesn't know when a now is a now, right? Um, and that's, um, that's certainly something that we, uh, um, I think we can see, through a you know a, a thread which goes through a lot of these things, so I think that Arthur's impetuous. You know, I have the hots for this woman who is visiting my court. I'm going to uh, look into a little bit of a do right with her. That's not that. I think that in the end, I think that that's not okay. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not in now. Now, Craig, I agree with you. Incest is bad in itself. It's w whether it's known or not. Agreed. I absolutely agree. That would be kind of a big deal, um, no matter what. Yes. Um, but. But Merlin keeps saying. God is angry at you because of what you did, right? You did a wrong thing. Like, he needs to repent of it. Um, he needs to... Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Lee, I agree that her knowledge is left in doubt. Um, she was sent thither to a spy the court. Does suggest that she is there with duplicitous motives. Did Morgaz actually seduce him? Right. Is this. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Was she put up to this by lot? Was this part of the package? Was this a bonus? Was I don't know, you know, exactly uh, what her role exactly was in there. Um, uh, now, I agree. I'll think about this some more. But um, so several of you are insisting that the differences between the two situations are less minor than I'm making them out. It's not just that she's married. Um, she's got kids, right? She, she is not only just married, she's not just married to anyone. She's married to the chief of his enemies, King Lot. And she's not just married, she got four kids that she comes to the court with, right? Um, the situation with Leonor's, the unmarried damsel, uh, in the other section is totally different. Yes. Again, the problem that I keep coming back to is nobody ever brings that up, right? Um, Aunt Carrie, so did Egrain. Exactly. And Egrain acted very differently from more, from more Gauss, right? More Gauss, more gays, um, agrees, right? And that I think is culpable, on her part, Igraine is passing wise for acting as she acted, right? Um, but um, just in case we were in any doubt about whether or not Arthur was in the wrong here and is bearing some culpability, and in case we've missed Merlin's frequent reminders that he is, um, that he's, uh, um, uh, um, in case he's missed um, all Merlin's reminders that God is not his friend anymore because he had sex with his sister um, we get uh, our 
last passage here. Fan King Arthur, let send for all the children that were born in Mayday, begotten of lords and born of laddies, for Merlion told King Arthur that he that should destroy him and all the land should be born on my day. Therefore he sent for him in pain, sent for him all in pain of death, and so there were found many lords sonus and many knictis sonus, and all were sent unto the king, and so was Mordred sent by King Lot his wife. And all were put in a ship to the sea, and some were four weeks old, and some less. And so by fortune the ship drove unto a castle, and was all torriven and destroyed for the most party, and destroyed the most party, save that Mordred was cast up, and a good man found him, and fostered him till he was fourteen year of age, and then brought him to the court, as it rehearseth afterward, and towards the end of the Mont Arthur. So many lords and barones of this realm were displeased, for their children were so lost, and many put the white on Merlion more than on Arthur. So what for dread and for love they held their pace. Oh, and there we have an example of love being used in a non-sexual sense, having just said that. Um, <laughs> is his middle name Herod? I know, right? Uh, I called this the reverse Herod, right? It's not the anti-Herod, because he is, in fact, doing just what Herod did, but it's the reverse Herod, right? Because instead of uh, trying to destroy the the chosen one that's going to save everybody uh, and set them all free, you're you're trying to destroy the one who's going to destroy everything, right? So it's like doing the Herod for good intentions instead of doing the Herod for bad intentions. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, sorry, I shouldn't make biblical references and assume everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, King Herod, of course, is the one who orders the massacre of the innocents uh, in hearing that the new king of Israel has been born uh, somewhere in the greater Bethlehem region. Uh, he orders all of the, 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 the Jewish boy children under two years of age to be massacred in an attempt to kill the Christ child, um, who it is rumored, it is prophesied, is going to become king of Israel, which he's kind of sensitive about because that is his own personal position. So um, he doesn't. Uh, anyway, so he's trying to kill the upcoming king. Um, uh, so that's exactly what Arthur is doing for different reasons. Right. His motivations are different. But. Um, uh But there is no two ways about the discomfort here, right? This is a bad, bad move. I'm gonna kill all of the, uh, all of the the boy children four weeks old and younger. He at least has more precision than Herod does, right? Um, he's a little bit less thoroughgoing because he's got Merlin, right? And Merlin can tell him exactly when he was born. So, um, uh, Craig says, "Are we supposed to condemn or applaud him for this murder?" Um, Condemn. No question. Condemn. Um, and we can see that the displeasure of the lords and barons of the realm show like this is this is a bad move. Right. Um, and the parallel with Herod, which would have been obvious. To, I mean, everybody would be thinking of King Herod. Right. And King Herod in like medieval mystery plays, when they do the mystery plays where they uh, where they um, they act out like all the, the Bible stories which are awesome, by the way. Um, King Herod is always a comical villain. I mean, he's like a foaming at the mouth, biting the heads off of babies kind of villain. Um, so Arthur putting himself into the Herod role, even though his motivations are different, right? He's not just become a villain, right? He's not just become this sort of demonic figure um, slaughtering children for fun. Um, his his motivations are, are good, right? He's trying to save the realm. But this is not the way to do it, right? This is clearly a wrong thing to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jennifer says, why is Merlin giving advice that he knows won't work? Uh, does he know it won't work? Why didn't he stop all this earlier? It's a really a wonderful um, it's a really wonderful question, Jennifer. Why doesn't Merlin why does Merlin tell him this? 
Oh, so, um, yeah, uh, he that should destroy you and all the land is going to be born on May Day. Just do with that information what you will, right? It seems like he's testing him again, and Arthur is failing the test. But notice how it's, um, it's Merlin who gets blamed, right? And Tom, it is interesting that being found by a good man makes no difference in Mordred, right? Yeah, Mordred's story is, is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Tom says maybe Merlin is, uh, is assuming that Arthur won't listen, right? Because you mean because he doesn't listen any other time? Yeah, uh, that does seem, that does seem plausible. Um, yeah. yeah, David, you could argue that these murders bring about the feared destruction. And so like Tomas has been pointing out, you know, it shouldn't be any surprise to anybody, right? I mean, you don't even have to have read Oedipus to know that this kind of thing is not the way is not the way to do it. Because of course, note, um, Merlin telling him that the he who should destroy him and all the land is going to be born on May Day. Um, that's not. Um, he's not telling him that so that he can escape it. Merlin isn't in the business of saying, you may prevent this fate if you do that, right? Um, sometimes he tells him what would happen, like if you keep fighting today, your fortune is going to turn against you and they're going to start winning, right? They're going to increase. But he, uh, his main job is saying, this is what's going to happen, right? His message to Arthur about Mordred, his message to Arthur about the one who should come is not take heed lest he come, right? His message is he's coming now. Having had sex with your sister, you are now hosed. It's over, right? Like the doom of your, of your realm is now sealed. It's when Merlin, when Merlin speaks in the future indicative, it happens without exception that I can think of. Um, when Merlin tells you it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And yet, um, Arthur is driven to try to avoid it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Sarah Grant says she can almost can't help thinking about Maeglin and his origin story and all this. Uh, she's not sure whether Maeglin or Mordred has much of a chance. Yeah, it, it actually would be a really interesting comparison, wouldn't it? Um, um, yeah, a uh, a Mordred, Maeglin, and even an Arthur uh, 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 Turin comparison would be kind of interesting, right? Um and Lee's wondering why, if they're all born on May Day, uh, are they different ages? Uh, some four weeks old and some less. Uh, well, you know, roughly May Day-ish, right? You know, like it's, it, you know, you gotta, because, uh, you know, May Day plus or minus, basically. Um, yeah, so, and honestly, I think of all of the things that Arthur, this is the worst. This is the worst thing that Arthur's going to do. Um, we, we end today and for the next fortnight with Arthur at really at his lowest point, right? Um, as I said at the beginning, this is a, the, today's class is a collection of Arthur, um, being glorious in battle at the very beginning, but then screwing up again and again and again, not listening to Merlin, not heeding his warnings, not learning the lessons that Merlin is going way out of his way to try to teach him, even though they're not always very clear what they are, because Arthur is so thoroughly failing to uh, to learn them that we don't ever even get to know what he was trying to teach him sometimes, right? Um, but uh, yeah, Matthew says perhaps Merlin speaks because he has to. He has his role to play in the tragedy. Yeah, there's a, there's a strong... Um, there's a strong strain of, um, uh, oh, what's her name? It's late and I'm blanking. Cassandra. Whew. Ah, yeah. Cassandra. There's a strong strain of Cassandra in Merlin. Um, he's going to tell everybody what's going to happen. Most people aren't going to listen. Right. But he's going to tell them exactly what's going to happen. Um, 
Yeah, Tarlonio, it is going to be uphill from here. Um, we will never see Arthur as despicable as we've seen him at various points in today's class. Um, uh, but uh, but this is where it begins, right? The death of Arthur starts here, and it's going to be finally enacted later on, and lots of things need to happen in order to set up both the glory that his court is going to achieve and the height from which he's going to fall and the circumstances of that fall. But... Um, uh, but he's, um, uh, d- d- you know, his, uh, he's, he's made his bed right now. It, it just takes him a while before he has to, he has to lie in it. Um, but all right, I'm going to let you guys go with that. Thanks everybody. I, I went late tonight, which I shouldn't have done, but I didn't like to leave it in the middle of a discussion like that. I want to come to an ending point here because we're taking a week off. So I will see you guys in a fortnight. Uh, uh, have a, have a, have a good week off. And um, next time the story of Sir Balin and Sir Balin, Sir Balin and or Sir, Sir Balin and Sir Balan. I know they, they, they sound more different in Middle English than they do in Modern English. But anyway, it's going to be fun. Um, I love the story of Sir Balan. So thanks, everybody, and I will see you guys in two weeks. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.